What's up, everyone? Uh, you are listening to a special edition of the Coaches Podcast. Today, we have Kyle Sherb and myself in the house to talk to you um, about a topic that we've kind of pushed out to our community, and that is being brilliant in the basics. And we apply that. We want to apply that um, as both coaches and members. So today, we're going to talk about that. We're going to get into a deep dive in kind of the way that maybe we apply those things as coaches while we talk about phase four for affiliates, which is going to run from January 9th through February 25th. So it's going to, it's a great opportunity for you guys to get your affiliates on board, kind of leading into the open, something that we really enjoy kind of leveraging as a great opportunity for community building and for your members to express all the fitness that they've worked on over the last year. Enjoy the podcast. What's going on, everyone? Welcome back to the Misfit Podcast. Today, we have got a, I don't know if special edition is the right word, but we're going with the uh, the Team Misfit Affiliate Coaches Podcast today. Um, and we got the Affiliate Goon Squad in the house, myself, Shreb, Kyle. Yo. Gentlemen, how are we doing? Great. Good. Good. Great. You know, holidays are here. It's just about to give us two day weekend, which is pretty sweet. You know, CrossFit coach doesn't two get a lot of it. I know, isn't that kind of crazy? Yeah. But honestly, a lot of CrossFit coaches work weird schedules where like uh, two full days away from work and a chance to like spend time with family and like not be driven to the gym, even for a couple of days yeah. reprieve is really nice. So, you know, one thing that we'd, you know, I <laughs> care a little bit of pushback from a couple of members and I try to explain to them like, hey, we're open. Coaches are people too. We're, we're open like 362 <laughs> days out of the year. Like there are very rare instances where we're like fully closed for a day. And like, there's a pretty good chance that someone with a key that works here will probably still come into work out. So like yeah. stay tuned on Facebook, but like, we're not going to make anybody come in for like even day for we're Christmas Eve, Christmas day. We're shutting it down on Earth Day next year, I swear to God. <laughs> <laughs> no classes on Earth Day. Yeah, I'll see about that. Um, all right, before we get into the topic, question the question of the day, this was a good one, is what was your, uh, what was the best Yankee Swap gift that you saw at your respective Jim's Yankee Swap? For listeners, we had a Jim, both, both Mitt, Wyndham, and Portland had a holiday party that, uh, you know, do the 12 days of Christmas workout, and then we get some food and do a Yankee swap after. And, uh, there's some, some people get creative to say the least. What do you got? Sure. Yeah. I, saw, I mean, we I try to Portland. try to say to, to everybody when we were like leading up to the party, like, Hey, sometimes the gag gifts, the ones that are slightly inappropriate are going to be a little bit more funny than like, uh, you know, I don't know, here's a pair of mittens or something that lame. But so we, <laughs> we, we, sorry, someone made new mittens for you. <laughs> 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 they, <laughs> they were great mittens. They were great. Um, but like, like guys. last year, for example, I got a Bob Ross, uh, Chia pet. So like, that was what my uh, Yankee swap gift to somebody else was that, this year. Uh, whoever got that. Well, you just special? <laughs> yeah, it sat on my desk for 364 <laughs> yeah, days. Yeah, for 364 days. <laughs> but, um, this year I actually got a Rudolph the Red Nose, uh, reindeer mankini. If you've seen Bob Borat, that lime green bathing suit he wears in that movie oh, is exactly yeah. what I got for Rudolph. So, um, no, I'm not going to put it on, and no, no one's gonna, ever going to see it. But <laughs> it did make for a pretty excellent gift and like a pretty good gag. Well, the gift. funny thing is that first it, it was given to one of the members' kids at Wyndham, and she's like a 15 year old girl, and. Josh, fuck. Josh is it's his daughter. Is like, what the fuck? Who's giving my daughter this outfit? Because <laughs> definitely not appropriate for anyone to be wearing out in public. But you know, made for some good laughs, and that you know, that's the idea behind that whole event, anyways, is to get some fucking gag laughs out of yeah. it. Kyle, what you got? Uh, I won't steal yours. I know. I think I know what you're gonna say. You, you can. You can. Oh, I well, got, I got, I got your another one. I got favorite. another one. All right, all right. So there was, uh, there was a someone opened up a gift, and it was just a loaf of bread. Ooh, I like but, it. But upon further inspection, someone had hollowed out the whole loaf of bread and stuck a bottle of wine, you know, a decoy bottle of wine, as a decoy loaf of bread. Yes. So I thought that was pretty clever it was little clever. play play on words. So there. it was the bottle you know. empty? Oh, no, it was a okay. full bottle of wine. <laughs> it's an empty bottle of wine instead <laughs> of a loaf of bread. It's like <laughs> the worst gift I've heard in my life. Yeah. <laughs> I but like I, that. I though. don't know how much like uh, attention to detail that took to like hollow out the whole loaf of bread just yeah you know just like the, you know, just like put the loaf on end just right. jam it straight down because like, that's like what like i would do three or four minutes to do You're still three or four, four whole minutes <laughs> yeah so that yeah. was i thought that was cool that was a good one mm -hmm. um yeah my uh i was the i don't want to say victim because it was this was pretty good but one of our one of our beloved members robin uh woman that i've like were i 
worked with. We she's not doesn't hesitate to shoot me a message. She's she'll say if I'm hey I can't make it to the gym today. Can you give me something to do at home? And I'll uh, you know try to give her a workout at home because she's she's getting she's trying to get her work in if she can't make it to one of the classes, which is great. Um, but she decided to uh, find an image on the internet, put them on a pair of pants, and uh, uh, acquire a matching t-shirt that said hunter on it and had like a like almost like an anime style character did it it didn't look i don't think it was me it just said hunter uh, on I it i think i think it was some sort of anime character named hunter yeah okay so <laughs> it wasn't me in anime form she found it was a, shirt yeah i was a little bit i was a little bit it. disappointed but <laughs> mostly um yeah one of our one of our members now has a pair of pajama pants with my head all over them um which was pretty hilarious. Yeah. yeah, he was. He put them on. He was just like, nobody fucking steal this. <laughs> That's how we. And then there was, a, like, there was an Instagram photo later. Yes. at home. Yeah, there home was. The Matt, Matt, <laughs> Matt provided uh, some some. At was there home, a caption that was associated with it? Content. There, there was. It was. Uh, was and it I, I made sure to work. I made, no, I made, <laughs> made sure to repost to say that it was the, uh, the uh, an ideal fit. Matt, Matt rocks them pretty good. So probably the <laughs> ideal candidate for wearing my face on pajamas that's, for the next pants. year yeah <laughs> did give me a good idea for member gifts next year everybody's gonna get a picture of uh maybe a coffee mug with my face on it instead Yikes. of uh, all right yeah uh great great gym event if you guys are are looking for one around the holiday time frame but um okay topic for the day so we're gonna we're gonna talk about the about phase four for affiliates coming up that starts on january 9th and rolls all the way through kind of the end of february last day is february 25th um seven week training phase that takes us really nicely kind of through or into rather into week one of the open um so phase four for affiliates if you're you, you, uh, if you're normally a Misfit Athletics listener, um, understand that this this doesn't apply to you and your individual programs. That's quite a, that's going to be a, a little bit different this year. But for affiliates, um, we're going to roll right into phase four, and um, it's I think it's going to be a good a pretty good phase with the the way that we've kind of restructured the programming a little bit for the phase specifically. Um, and we're also going to talk about kind of the topic of the day being um, something that I wrote to our coaches and members um, as kind of a call to action to really uh, kind of look back a little bit, look back on your progress, look back and, and assess the things that you want to get better at. Um, and either way, it's going to come down to the idea of being brilliant in the basics. Uh, and that's kind of a, for me, that was like, I, that was a term that was introduced to me in the military in CrossFit terms. It's something that you, Sherb, talk about all the time, which is virtuosity. Um, the idea of doing kind of the common, uncommonly well, being exceptionally good at the most simple things, because that's kind of the foundation for success. Yeah, it always brings me back to that, like that old journal article. It's like once you think you've mastered everything, start over again and try to get brilliant in the basics. Yeah. And the idea behind that is that. You know, there's this like novice curse to like try to jump ahead and learn all the, the cool, sexy movements, the legless rope climbs, the snatches, the muscle ups. And it's like, you don't have a solid push up yet. You don't have a solid air squat yet. You can't do a five minute Metcon without stopping three times in the middle of it. Like, and you know, as coaches, we want to set everybody on a trajectory that eventually gets them to, you know, the pot of gold, at the end of the rainbow there where, Hey, you can get to this point just realize that your journey is different from everybody else's. And what I'm trying to stress here is that if we set you up with proper movement mechanics early on, you'll carry those mechanics as you develop more skill and more complexity and more intensity in your movements. And then you don't default to poor positions that end up getting you hurt. You know, this is a, a topic that's really important to me because as an affiliate owner and as a coach, like my number one job is to make someone healthier. If I'm getting them hurt, I am doing the exact opposite. So oftentimes I'm the coach that might be on the uh, lamer side of things and not let an athlete just do whatever they want. One, because I wanna make sure they have a good experience. And while the experience of like, hey, you're gonna back things down and go lighter might feel lame in the moment, I very rarely have someone push back and be like, oh, you were right, that was so easy. Usually they understand at the end of the workout why I asked them to go that route. And it's our job as coaches to set the tone for how we want our classes to run and how we want our athletes to think and move and think about how they're gonna approach their training and how they do each individual movement so they can remain consistent in the gym because the quickest way to get someone to leave your gym is to get them hurt. So, you know, that's why these fundamentals are so important to me is that if 
we want a long-term success in this gym. And I really believe that someone could walk through a CrossFit gym when they're 18 and continue doing CrossFit all the way to their, you know, death's door. If they do it appropriately, a lot of people burn out or flame out early because of things like being allowed to do whatever they want or doing the skills they're not ready for, or just having a subpar experience because they're not taught the fundamentals ahead of the complicated stuff. Yeah. And I think the the same thing applies. The, there was, I wrote, wrote two different things, one more geared towards the members and kind of the, the call to action of, Hey, like take, take more pride in your air squat than you do your, your deadlift max. Um, and that's obviously that there's a little bit of nuance to that, but the idea is that like, Hey, we, we are here, we are here to make you healthier. And I think another thing that you kind of mentioned that got, might get lost is like people, athletes just generally want to get better faster um, faster than the, the rate that they're currently improving at, even if they are improving, it's, you know, there's always the desire to get a little bit more like, what's the next hack? What's the, you know, how do I, how do I make that big leap in performance? And, and there's certainly ways to do that. And like, I love helping members do that as well. But, um, there's also the underlying kind of idea that, we, we do want that kind of low trajectory to a distant horizon idea where it's like you, I, I would rather you get a fraction of a percent better every single day than have the massive, you know, the ebbs and flows of just like, I'm the fittest human on earth and I hate CrossFit. I'm the fittest human on earth. This place blows. Now I'm a marathon runner or a weightlifter. Like we, that's, that's not a, that's not a tenable long-term strategy. You're talking about our coaches group with Mark right now. Sorry, Mark. No, it's funny you say that because this is actually a topic I brought it to the members yesterday. We had our high CNS snatch day yesterday, our first day of three, two, and one. And this might seem like a heresy when I say this, but we didn't warm up the snatch all that much. And people are like, Hey, the last four weeks we've been doing the, you know, reps from power position and then reps from the low hang and then tempo reps. And like, we've gotten really good at that. But as coaches, if you deliver the same class every single time, or you don't create stale. nuance in your class, it gets yeah. stale, it gets boring. People don't want to come back. So yesterday what we decided to do is we pulled out the air bikes, we put them down the middle of the two hallways, the kind of the areas we have are like two rec like long rectangles, put the bikes down the middle. And I told everybody to put their bar in the rack go grab a medicine ball and all we did was bike a little bit and then do pause there uh overhead squats and i asked the members at the end i'm like hey anybody anybody have an idea why we did pause overhead squats rather than like warm up the snatch and everyone was like the overhead squats are part of the snatch i'm like beautiful but what about the pause and the overhead squat applies to your snatch and i got you know got the blank stares i'm not so sure and i said if you can't sit in the bottom of your overhead squat when you catch a snatch, you probably didn't snatch all that well. So the idea here is there is so many different components to why someone could have success or failure in the snatch. And again, failure is air quotes, it's just like learning. But for a lot of people, it's they aren't deliberate with how they sit in the bottom of their overhead squat. They don't pull the bar to the right spot. They're not balanced in their feet. They're not active in their shoulders. They're not pushing their knees. There's so many different things that the basically the overhead squat allows them to hone in on things that pertain to the snatch, but eliminate the complexity of the pull, which can confuse athletes or just add more nuance to the movement, which makes it harder to teach. So I said, hey, we're just gonna spend the first 15 minutes of class getting comfortable in the bottom of the overhead squat, because if you're not comfortable down there, you're not gonna snatch well. And that's kind of what I like to think about as a nice like parallel between the topic of today and like, you know, doing the more complicated things. If you don't have a good overhead squat, the, re the purpose behind snatching is, you know, probably teaching someone how to use their hips, but they're not gonna be an effective snatcher until their overhead squat is mastered. Their overhead squats not mastered until their air squats mastered. So like, there's always a way to kind of backtrack there. And that's how I like to try to connect the dots for athletes who were like, my God, how many times are you gonna say, keep your knees out in the air squat? It's like, I'm gonna say it every goddamn time because it translates to the things that I know you really care about, the things that you wanna do better. Maybe that have a little bit more of a sex appeal when it comes to movements rather than like the boring mundane movements like an air squat or a push up. I mean, we've been like slowly starting to do those kind of things. I mean, you're taking the, the initiative of putting it into your warm up, but we've been putting it into the programming of like the snatch mobility stuff. You know, like we go through a whole snatch session for 40 minutes, 30, 40 minutes. And then it's like, if you were having a hard time, you know, receiving that bar, like punching underneath the bar, well, maybe you need to sit in the overhead squat at the end of class here. Having a hard time, you know, your hips are tight couch stretch so we like provide those things for members so as coaches you know we can look at that list know our athletes and try to help them you know get better at those basic you know uh bricks you know to 
put that put together that movement. Yeah, for sure. And I think that's that's also one of the reasons that we program a skill lift, usually a lift a lot of times and and gymnastics like skill whatever, you know, basically we take something that's a little more complex and focus on it um throughout the phase and and part of the way that we do that is, you know, one phase will be a skill lift, the next phase will will allow athletes to use that skill to maybe unlock a little bit of the strength or capacity that they they might not have had before and um we're in phase three right now we are doing um we're doing that with the back squat where basically every week has a combination of either a tempo or a pause one or the other sometimes both um which for misfit if you've been following for any period of time you know that that probably means it's coming up next as the high cns lift which it is so in phase four we have that we have kind of a modified texas method which is a which is five sets of five every week where we you know at the end of phase three we'll find a five rep max and then once a week it's five sets of five and um i think now is a great time to kind of also address the 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 idea of being brilliant in the basics from a coaching perspective and we've gotten feedback on folks with some folks who are like, man, we really we like the li- the lift only day is good, but we wish that we wish there was a short Metcon at the end. And in our mind, the way that we'll run a class at a gym, it's like, holy fuck, a five by five back squat at the at the right weight, at the right intensity for every athlete. That's an hour session on its own, let alone um you know, if we take, we take that like a really solid 20 minutes to get people sweaty, get them activated, get them moving through the correct range of motion, reiterating, you know, the basics of the air squat, because, you know, lo, you know, it mechanics before intensity. Um, and then, you know, at the actual warm up and execution of that session should be a full, full hour like easily yeah i look at that se- that session and for the listeners maybe aren't kind of following along like an example at our gym is we might ask athletes to dig out a machine and for the first eight to 12 minutes you're going to build an intensity across the machine to get you know the blood pumping get the tissues nice and warm make sure your you know joints have laxity in them they can you know extend and him flex as we want them to and then after that session we might go through things like activation we put the glute bands on we walk for two to four minutes we make some air squats in there we make sure like the knees can track out people have their glutes turned on we might address things like ankle mobility or hip mobility ahead of that and then it's hey let's break it down kind of the points performance that we're looking for with one athlete kind of showcasing and the coach kind of talking through things and then we say hey guys for the next 10 to 12 minutes you're going to build up to your starting weight like you're going to literally take 10 to 12 minutes in small jumps building your way to starting weight and at this point we're already almost halfway through the class before we even say all right now the clock's going on for round one let's try to do one set of five every five minutes yeah and then there's the rest of your class leaving in about five minutes the back end for any stragglers who haven't finished squatting yet or if you're done a little bit early like hey let's make sure we actually wind down from the session because we just you know put ourselves in a situation that is you stress or positive stress that doesn't mean we just be like oh because it's good stress we just stop and then leave it's like no we gotta take people back down the mountain the same way we would if it were a metcon it just might feel different because you're not gasping for air, but instead your legs are fried because of all that heavy lifting. So really easily you can make a class like that an hour long, if done in a way where you're really thinking ahead of like all the boxes you sort of need to check as coaches. And, you know, at first it might feel a little routine, a little boring, and that's fine when the first couple of times you're getting used to that and then start experimenting or start looking for other ways or other avenues to get someone ready. You know, maybe instead of one day of doing glute activation, you have people do seated box jumps to prime their hips to be explosive. Like, as coaches, we need to constantly seek out ways to create the adaptation we want to happen ahead of a lifting session or ahead of a class. And the more variety and the more uh, the various ways you can explain it to athletes, the more you're going to get buy-in because one, it's creative and fun and nif- different. So it's novel. So people are excited about something new. But two, it shows your acumen to realize that there are a whole host of things you need to get ready ahead of a heavy lifting day and that you can't obviously get to every single one of them every single time. But if in a seven week progression, you touch on one thing week one, something different in week two, across seven weeks, you can make huge change in the way an athlete moves. Um, For sure. The skill lift. So we just kind of alluded to the fact that we'll build in kind of a, a skill component in one phase and then get athletes uh, moving that you know, it's probably going to be something heavier in the next phase, but, um, because of the time of year when we're, you know, we are trying to, you know, we've, we've 
done that style of training for the entire year where we do have seven week chunks where we focus on a couple of specific things. We don't ever sacrifice general physical preparedness or an athlete's kind of conditioning and readiness for those things. But we do focus a little bit more on that stuff so that an athlete can improve it and then you know, theoretically their, their GPP increases as well. But with this time of year being, um, kind of the, almost the, the unknown and unknowable season that GPP lift, we, we kind of change to, or I'm sorry, we change the skill lift to more of a GPP style where it's like, what are we missing? What are, what is, let's look at the entire week. Let's look at the, you know, the loading, making sure that we're doing high rep as well as low rep and heavy. Are we going long? Are we going short? Are we going medium? Um, and we're essentially just saying like, hey, we don't know what's going to get thrown our way as with most things in life. Um, and we're going to we're just going to try to fill in the gaps there so that, you know, athletes aren't going seven weeks without having done a heavy deadlift in a Metcon or haven't done a split jerk, for example, or something like that. Um, and I think this will be a good way to make sure that athletes are still confident in movements that would otherwise might not pop up as frequently in the programming. Yeah, the uh, GPP lift is really important for a lot of athletes because it's it, the, that's the skill. That's kind of the skill. But that 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 element is really is, is really important because again, one one common sentiment you'll hear at your gym if you haven't done some for a while is like, oh, I have no idea. I haven't done it in a really long time. And like, true variants should mix those things in more regularly. So like, this is a you know a call on our end. Like, hey, we noticed that like when we're doing maybe a skill lift and it also happens to be you know some sort of snatching and the high CNS also has some sort of snatching in there that we might be missing clean and jerk for a little while. So it's just an opportunity for your athletes to get exposure to those things and you know. I like to think of the GPP lift when I'm explaining it to athletes like, hey, because this isn't the primary lift or the high scenus lift for the phase, like go with how your body feels. If it's not feeling great, make this more of a technique based session where you're really trying to hammer on one specific part of the movement that's been giving you trouble for a long time. Or if you feel great, let's see where you're at and let's really test your actual GPP, which is what's really cool about this is it kind of has, if you can explain this to your members, it can have different applications for different athletes and they all can kind of scratch the same itch, which is getting better at the movement. Um, for the gymnastics work this phase. So similar kind of idea. It's going to rotate a little bit. Um, there's not going to be a singular movement focus for gymnastics. Um, what we're doing instead is <clears throat> so one day per week, the front half of class or a one of, one of the two parts in class will be a, a gymnastics, a gymnastics movement. Um, and then what we'll do is we'll take that movement that was done in that week and then the following week, it'll find its way into a Metcon. So, for example, week one, um, we have some gymnastics, some handstand push-up work on Tuesday. And that's kind of part of the skill session for the day. It's not under intensity. Um, and then the following week, that those handstand push-ups get snuck into usually a manageable dose inside of a Metcon. So, athletes, basically, the idea is that in week one, they practiced kind of the mechanics and consistency the following week we can add that into intensity a little bit because obviously you know we want athletes prepared to to do those movements should they pop up in the open yeah i mean the only other thing i would say about that when these with these sessions like it would be a mistake as a coach not to call upon what they did last week like going into that class exactly, talk, yep. talk to one of your talk to your all your athletes but talk to these athletes and say hey what was the one thing you were trying to get from last week's session? Or is there one thing in particular that you were working on with your coach? Cause it might not have been you last time. It might've been someone else on staff and you know, that can serve as an anchor point or as a way to help build that camaraderie between a coach and an athlete, that rapport that helps make training more successful. If you can double down on that and use that information to your advantage to help an athlete conquer something they couldn't conquer last week, that is a huge way to really make the community tighter and make you have a tighter bond with your athlete, which helps build, you know, that respectful, uh, I wouldn't say necessarily boundary, but that relation between the two of you so that they know that you have your best interests in mind. Because oftentimes when you give an athlete scaling advice or modification advice, it's sort of met with a, uh, oh, either you don't believe in me or I think I can do this. And sometimes that can like draw away from that, like that bank account of like trust until you prove it to them. So like, this is an easy way for you to help strengthen your this rapport with athletes. You do a pretty good job of, you like to, you know, we had rowing earlier in the week where it was like the pacing instruction was based on a 5k or a 2k split whatever you know a pr pace and you were like hey wrote up on the whiteboard hey the last time you rode 5k was this date you can and hopefully if you were an athlete you you could go into sugar one and be like oh yeah that's yeah, my yeah. that's my pr 
Yeah, I mean, it just comes down to, I mean, Mr. Athletics, obviously, we talk about athlete IQ and, you know, diligent note taking and everything with you know, your training, but the affiliate members might not do that as much or you get people who just don't care that much. They're coming in to sweat for, you know, 60 minutes or whatever, just so, you know, for general health. But, you know, you have the few people in the class or you probably have more people than you know who actually do like really like care and they're giving them an opportunity to kind of be a higher level like athlete in the moment be like okay i did this this is my pace now i'm going to try to use that information and put it into action so if you can give them you know kind of like set them up for that it's pretty cool yeah it's an opportunity for ownership and like you might have an opinion on an athlete that they you think they only care this like level they might they're give a shit's only like a a d or a c or a b or an a like you know if you were gonna give it a grade and you might be wrong and this is also an opportunity if you do use tracking software or if you have you know you want to talk to an athlete about progressing and having concrete data because it's something you talk about a lot like uh, hunter if you have goals they should hopefully be you know objective and we can measure them their progress well if you don't keep track of your information how will you know you're progressing so it always goes back to me you know talking with athletes and saying hey you can't tell me you want to get fitter without defining what that means for you and if you really do care like this is a step that people who care make you have to make this step otherwise your training well, it's still, you know, scratch the GPP itch, but it might not be as effective as it could be had you taken better notes. Um, I think the the gymnastics topic is always, and this was kind of part of, again, part of the address to both coaches and members. Like, um, I can I can count my, I've I've had a lot of instances where members will come up and be like, "Hey, I want to get better at." at a gym an insert gymnastics movement here. I really want to get my bar muscle ups. I really want to get my pull ups or butterfly pull ups before the open. Um, and the, the straight up, the straight up answer is just like, Hey, gymnastics are a strength to body weight ratio thing. Okay. And without, you know, in a, in such a, in a tactful manner, it's saying like, Hey, we need to focus on nutrition because you might be carrying around body mass that is not conducive to improving gymnastics movements. Okay. There's no specific program on the planet that's going to get you better at those gymnastics movements. If the nutrition side of the equation isn't also addressed the nutrition lifestyle, making sure that you are operating as an affiliate athlete at the kind of ideal body weight and body mass index or, or, you know, lean body mass kind of ratio uh, to to be successful and and this is one of those topics that's always really difficult to to address with a member um, and my response to that is there might not be a more qualified person in any of your members lives to tell them that your nutri your success like your your fitness and health like overarching health hinges upon your willingness to you know take kind of your other 23 hours of the day, you're outside of the gym lifestyle, uh, seriously. And that, you know, that's nutrition, sleep, hydration, all those Wait, sorts of things. It's not your willingness to take more pills from hey, the doctor. I mean, there's a reason that nutrition is kind of at the bottom, you know, at the base of the pyramid and as coaches, like that's to me, that's like, that's an element of brilliance in the basics. It's like, if you, you get an athlete who's, you know, wants to improve their gymnastics, but it's clear that their nutrition is not on point. It's like, don't fucking lie about that. Like you be like, try to try to approach that conversation in a respectful manner. But like I said, there, there might not be a more, there's no more, you, you that person's not going to go to their spouse and say, you know, ask for advice on that. Right. That's like a fucking danger, close topic family member. Like, but you want, do you want a family member telling you like, oh, man, like your gymnastics would be better if you, you know, if candy canes weren't part of your, you know, part of part, <laughs> didn't, didn't fulfill 20% of your, you know, calories in a day. Um, the, the, the members pay you for that advice. They're coming to you for health and fitness. They think they're coming to you to learn how to squat and to jump rope and do, you know, those sorts of things. And they are, but, uh, if you are omitting that kind of baseline, like, Hey, Everything you do in here hinges upon the manner in which you fuel your body, um, both literally and figuratively outside the gym. Yeah, it's, it's funny. I, whenever we have these podcasts and someone starts talking about a topic, I, my mind does its best to stay on task, but it also has to drift towards like other things I'm thinking about. And all I could think about what you're saying, that's like, imagine the member came to you and was like, I want to run a faster mile. And they come in wearing concrete boots. And you're like, all right, 
it doesn't matter what program I have. We need to change your footwear. And they're like, no, 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 I, I need a program. It's like, no, it's, it's your footwear. Like, that's the problem. You're wearing concrete <laughs> boots right now. It's yeah, the same conversation you would have. I just, athlete, new, I just need the new nanos. I, yeah, swear, just, my, just, I swear my time is, is going to be, fe- my friend's going to be so much but it's faster like, it's if I got such these an, helium nanos. It's so important to talk about this topic. And it isn't a necessarily the most fun topic to have. But like, you have to be willing to have that because of how impactful it is. You know, the old, I think the old Glassman quotes, like, you know, nutri- uh, fitness program without nutrition at the forefront is like rowing a boat with one oar in the water like you're just going to go in circles and the same thing happens here we've seen athletes who have the same problem or the same thing holds them back in the open every single year or at a competition or they're at the same max you know three years from now and it's like those are the same people who are refused to take the advice and it's like hey i know it might sound like i'm you know telling you the wrong advice but try it try it for once and most people come back with success like anyone that i've worked with historically i'm on the nutrition has made tremendous strides and realizes that it's like, you know, it doesn't have to be perfect all the time, but if you're making a solid effort there, you're gonna see a lot more results at this gym, which means all the hard effort, all those terrible days where you go to the gym and you're sucking wind and you're laying on the, you know, the horse stall mats, like gasping for air and like, man, this sucks. Like those sessions still make you fitter, but they could even be more effective if you had that part of your life dialed in. And that's why I care so much about it. Every member that I have given macros to and they have followed and executed like correctly has seen progress. The that's not to like the way that I give members like basic macros is very straightforward. It's not hard. And I tell people like, I will happily give you macro the first, I need to see a seven day log of exactly what you're eating. Usually tell people to use my fitness pal. And I say like, you bring me, you bring me your phone seven days from now. And I see a seven days worth of nutrition tracking. I will give you macro numbers. Um, just because I don't have a ton of time to do the whole, like text me back and forth. Like whenever you have an, a, but you know, a nutrition question, we have coat other coaches who are, um, m- more qualified than I am to help with that. Um, but for the member who is a little bit more self or a little bit more autonomous and is just like, I just need a starting point. They, they've always seen, seen progress. And again, that's not that's not credit on me because I. It's not hard for me to give members those numbers. It's more of an execution thing. It's like a. Do you actually want to make these changes, or do you just do you want the results without the work that's required to do it? Yeah. Okay. Uh, moving on to another. Basically, if we we treated that gymnastics as kind of the foundation, uh, you know, addressing nutrition, kind of the base of the pyramid. The next rung above that is our our metabolic conditioning. So, um, one day per week in phase four, there is going to be just a monostructural. Um, machine-based day. Some of them, I can't remember specifically, a couple of them might have some other CrossFit movements built in just so it's not a, to mostly for, so members don't, aren't just fucking bored sitting on well, a we also, for we'll minutes, call but. things that are a little bit more, I mean, most gyms would consider them not cardio, not monostructural cardio things yep. like burpees and wall balls, exactly. and kettlebell yep. swings, things that like create a very specific, like fitness stimulus but don't have a huge technical nature in, in Low fact skill, them. probably no barbell like exactly. that sort of thing but we're basically saying like hey you're you know if we are planning to peak for the open or you know making athletes as ready as possible for the open like the open is a conditioning te- crossfit is a conditioning program um and there's not a, probably not a better way, especially for the affiliate level athlete to, um, to attack specific energy systems than to put people on a machine and tell them to go for X duration or, um, you know, X amount of work. Yeah. In our, to, in to a lot of our athletes that. eyes, they look at workouts as like either short, medium, long with not a lot of like nuance between what degrees of short can be, what degrees of medium can be and what is long. Sure. So like, you know, the way we would think about it, if we were training a high level competitive athlete, it's like the space that you go for 15 second effort versus the pace you go for a 45 second effort versus the pace you go for a three minute effort six so on and so forth are all different gears in your car now if you are at a highest level of our sport you're probably efficient and you can kind of modulate those speeds regardless of the skill nature of the movement but for a lot of our affiliate athletes who are coming two to four days a week like they just want to get better at being fitter and healthier and better at the sport. So it's like, hey, here's an opportunity for you to have no skill requirement whatsoever and just figure out what pace you can hold 
and what you can do repeatedly. So whether it's a single effort or multiple efforts, they start to learn more about themselves, which is why monostructural conditioning is so great. It takes a lot of the skill out of it and allows an athlete to be very aware because usually it's on a machine that spits out data and now you have more information on yourself. So it's a more useful situation. This is the exact same reason why this past week we had like, you know, with a partner rowing 130 on, and then you like 130 off. And I made a small adjustment in my affiliate classes to have a 10 second transition. And it did eliminate one full round for both partners. But at the end of the day, I was okay with that because they had data on all nine rounds that they did. And they figured out that like, all right, was it round six, you know, 17 minutes in where I started to fall apart? Or was I, did I start a little too conservative and maybe not push hard enough until the very end? That type of data is useful for an athlete. And that again, goes back to why tracking matters so much. But I want to both make an athlete fitter and educate them on what they're doing and why they are doing it. So like, if this is a situation where you have now the ability to communicate to an athlete, like, Hey, we're going to do six by 500 meter row with three minutes rest. You now know if this were an 18 minute, uh, AMRAP, this is what your 500 meter pace would be. And now you have more information so that you're not doing a bunch of hands on knees in the middle of a Metcon and instead are staying continuous, which is, you know, how we get an athlete to improve their overall conditioning is by not standing around. Yeah, I also, so I agree with what you did there. I took a different side of the coin for that same workout, a different class that I coached that same day. And like, yes, the athletes I had in that class were, I think a different like level of athletes. I had like four athletes that had just come off like finishing beginners this month. So like for that athlete, yes, trying to get them like numbers, like on a screen, having them start to learn that is good in one way. But I also think like for, like those athletes specifically, I just went off of like, you need to feel like the same way each time you get on. Like it can't feel too comfortable. Basically giving them a different way of thinking about it that might be a little easier than like, I need to see like this number on You just screen. explained what I wanted in plain English, which is another really valuable <laughs> right, coaching right. thing. You know, it's really easy as coaches to want to show off what you know. This energy system using your ATP PCR system. And it's like, the fuck you just say to me? I don't care. But then the open one, like the 15... <laughs> to 20 minute AMRAP comes up, like they gotta know, like, am I able to, like, what does this feel like? It feels like this on the machine where I have to repeat this over and over again. Can I take that and then put that into that long workout where there isn't a screen, you know, flashing think, in my face with a number? Yeah, well, I think both of your guys' points are really valid and good for, you know, if you're a coach listening to this, you have, there there has to be, an, there has to, you have to have kind of the range to communicate both things, right? You need to have, uh, in Sherb's instance, maybe you got an athlete who's been, who's been after it, after CrossFit for five plus years or whatever. And is, you know, I, I know how to row, but now I'm trying to collect data on my capacity. In your example, Kyle, you've got kit guys who are fresh out of beginners and it's just like, what's the big number on the monitor mean again? Right. And they, so there's no, <laughs> there's no context. There's no information, but that doesn't mean that they, we, as the coach, it's like, okay, so athlete a five years in five years into CrossFit, what's your two K PR? What's your five K PR? Okay. Here's what I think you should start at for a pace. Okay, you're a beginner. You finished up beginner's class two weeks ago. Uh, you forgot how to use the rower. That's okay. Let's refine the points of performance and get comfortable looking at the monitor. Uh, hey, maybe this round, try really hard and then see what happens in your next round. It's like, oh, that next round really sucked. It's like, okay, so we're, we're learning something. And as the coach, you have to be able to see within your group of athletes, like we have this one athlete who's very experienced. I have this brand spanking new athlete how can i bridge the gap between these two people without you know it, it without sacrificing quality for either of them yeah it's an important thing and again that range is a nice nice way to describe describe that and honestly like coaches when you're new to this stuff like stick to what you know but then start searching out what you haven't learned yet like you know for example in that rowing class I know a little bit about the force curve, you know, one of those screens on the rowing machine that shows you kind of the power across your entire stroke, but I wasn't super familiar on it, you know, up until recently. So for my own coaching data, like I know a lot about how to row. I know how to get an athlete to move correctly on a rowing machine, but it'd be nice to have evidence that they're, and they can prove to the athlete, Hey, this is an actual good rowing stroke. Look at the way it looks on the screen here and being able to communicate to an athlete, like, Hey, you don't need to talk about phases of the drive and like, you know, Newton's and force and shit. You just be like, Hey, if your curve looks like this, you're doing well. If your curve looks like that, this is what you want to fix. Being able to relay that information from a very high level of data that you understand and then boiling it down to everybody else, both shows your range as a coach, but also make sure that every single athlete gets a version of that class 
that they understand because it doesn't matter how much you know if you can't communicate to to them in a way that they'll understand, which is I think a thing that coaches get trapped in. They a lot of coaches have a very, you know, a high level of like give a shit themselves and want to learn a lot and then aren't always necessarily necessarily very good at taking that information and make sure like the I don't want to use like reading level, but the, the the dose that you give it to the athlete is appropriate for that athlete is in their journey. Yeah. And I think using like, that's a good example as well about like, as a coach kind of getting a little bit outside your comfort zone with like, okay, if I always teach this X movement in X way, um, you know, what am I leaving on the table? Cause odds are that the way that you communicate, um, the way that you teach or communicate something is not going to resonate with a hundred percent of your members, right? They're all going to learn in a, in a, in a different way. And, um, one, just picking out something that maybe you don't always focus on. Uh, maybe you stumble through that a little bit as a coach, as far as like, you know, it's, it's one thing to watch a YouTube video. That's like, here's how to teach this. And it's another thing to actually go in front of people and teach it and, uh, uh, figure out, you know, where your where the disconnect is. Um, but that's a way to, I mean, that's how co that's how we as coaches get better in the same way that an athlete wants to we want an athlete to occasionally overreach past their capability from time to time we have to be willing to to do the same thing teach something that's a little unfamiliar or in a different manner and if you bumble fuck your way through it a little bit the first time like yeah no shit that that was going to happen either way but the next time you do it it's a little bit better a little bit better after that and then it just becomes part of your you know your toolbox that you can used to communicate with athletes well, at like, all levels. For example, when Kyle teaches a class, he'll ask me after like what, what I thought of either the warm up or how things went. Mm -hmm. And I did the same thing with you the other day because you took that class in the rowing. And I was just like, yep. what'd you think of this style? Because one of the things that our, our gym in particular, were like we were trying to be very thorough about like the announcements in the gym, what's going on. And that like had led to like longer than necessary whiteboard briefs. So I was like, all right, I'm not gonna go on this really long diatribe on whiteboard brief in terms of announcements, but rather let me teach you something about rowing. And you know, you and I went back and forth in there and I asked you for your feedback after, and you know, you said it would have been nice if you had chunked it out a bit. Like coaches should want feedback like that. You shouldn't be like, oh, he said he didn't like it. I guess I'll never ask him again. It's like, no, you should find out from as many different people what they thought of that class that you, you know, know and trust and understand the difference between like, what is an average class, above average and an exceptional class. and take that feedback and then use that to be better. Because if you don't care to do that, like this might not be the profession for you. If you don't care enough to want to get better at it, like you might not have found your thing just yet. And it's not saying that you can't figure that out, or maybe you haven't found that one thing that makes you want to do that. But like, that's something that's really important to us as coaches at this gym and something that's a culture that we've established here and it's established in a culture we'd encourage you to establish in your facility. Because if your coaches are taking your classes and giving you feedback and you're all trying to push each other to be better or to like one up one another, you know, very rapidly, everyone's, you know, the, the tides are going to rise and lift all the ships because one person gave a shit enough to be like, Hey, how can I make this better? And now everybody else wants to do the same thing. Okay. Last, uh, last day for kind of the standard affiliate class. So we, we will also have one day per week. Um, and it, it'll alternate one week is going to be what we call the merry-go-round style kind of Metcon. Um, and a lot of instances, that's where that gymnastics movement will slot into. Uh, and for, you know, if you're not familiar, or maybe you're just new to the program, that's, that's the cardio feel workout that we will program when you see that, when you see on that, uh, either on the screen on sugar wad or in the the coaching document where the feel is cardio. Cardio is that kind of that workout where, you know, the movements are pretty manageable, done in manageable chunks as far as the size of the movements. If the barbell is heavier, it's probably for very few reps where athletes don't get stuck or it's a very, it's a much lighter barbell that athletes can move unbroken. Um, but those are the, those are kind of workouts where athletes, particularly affiliate athletes really, um, I get, yeah, struggle, I guess struggle is the right way because a lot of times they don't have any idea how to pace it or how to, you know, they're, the first five minutes of the workout is the greatest thing ever and then they realize that they're 25% of the way through that 20-minute AMRAP and the last 15 are fucking miserable. Um, so one day per week we'll have that kind of merry-go-round style workout or uh, maybe a more open-esque kind of spicy like, hey, this I could see this being an open workout or this has a special little uh, kick in the teeth kind of associated with it. And with the first week of phase four being having Friday the 13th, the Friday workout is a is about as classic kind of open style workout as you get with some, what do we got, wall balls, box jumps, and what was the other movement? You guys remember? Kicks in the teeth. Kicks in the <laughs> teeth. Teeth kicks. 
Yeah. I mean, right without here. belaboring that point, again, it's just an important thing to like get athletes used to understanding like, hey, oh, yeah. in, this, walks. Enjoy. <laughs> in this style of workout, <laughs> okay. you need to be very deliberate with how you know yourself and how you start. So this is an opportunity for a coach to maybe use the old practice round kind of vibe in class. Like, hey, let's get a general warm up in and then everybody grab everything you need for the workout. The exact same weights you're going to use for the workout. Let's do a practice round. Yeah. Let's review the practice round. Was that the right pace or was that the wrong pace? Let's rest a bit and let's try maybe one or two more times to help athletes dial that in because that's a skill, like you said, they're feeling fine for five minutes and then they feel horrible for 15. That's a pacing mistake or it's a movement inefficiency. And, you know, as coaches, we're trying to help them move in efficiency and we were kind of constantly talking about those things. But then it's also an opportunity to be like, hey, I don't want to hurt your feelings, but you're not quite fit enough or maybe that's not the right pace for you just yet. Consider trying to be a little bit slower at the beginning so maybe you can hold that pace by the end of the workout, not the very beginning. Um which I think kind of is a nice segue into the last part of this, which is like the competitor extra. So one thing that our gym did a really nice job of, and I think, I think the program does a nice job of making sure we check off or making sure athletes that give the give a shit enough to want to try to compete past the open quarterfinals, they have the opportunity to do that inside of our classes, which is a big kind of like nod to what we try to do at Team Misfit. We want to make a program that like, you know, your grandma can go do, but also someone who aspires to be competitive can also do, and they can work out side by side. So a couple of things that are a feature in the competitor extra is we're going to have one like quarter prep final kind of style wad. So think about the things that pop up in quarterfinals, the GHDs, the rope climbs, the shuttle runs. Um, I don't know. I'm probably missing a few there. I don't know if you want to add into that, but that's the kind uh, of like yeah, list off the top of my mind. I think it's just like, think about the, those style of workouts compared to open workouts or compared to your regular affiliate at workout. There might be, maybe there's a little bit of a wow factor you've got or movements that we don't program quite as often for a regular class. Like the ones that you said, rope climbs, legless rope climbs, you know, athletes using that GHD. Maybe we pull out that pistols. heavy 70 pound dumbbell, the pistols, that sort of thing. Um, but we're, we're essentially given that one once per week, kind of a beefier, prep workout for athletes looking to, to, to get after quarterfinals. And then, you know, we'll have the opportunity to do a little bit more lifting. So we'll inject another GPP lift throughout the phase for those people looking to do the competitor extra and a little bit more cardio for those athletes. And then probably the last thing I think we should really kind of highlight kind of going into this, finishing up this podcast and kind of going into this phase is our Metcon reset. It's something that we kind of debuted on misfitathletics.com, but we're now putting at the affiliate level. But essentially when you look at your programming, you're going to see two versions of the same workout. You're going to see it written kind of like straight through and then a version where things are kind of chunked and broken up based on what we think an athlete would be like begin to slow down in a Metcon. So like an example would be like three rounds, thousand meter row, 30 pull-ups, 30 thrusters. We might decide that like an athlete could do the thousand meter row and 20 of those 30 pull-ups before they start to like break things up and slow down. And we inject a short rest period there to give them the opportunity to give them like a quick reset so that when they pick back up with their workout, they can be working at the same pace they started at after a brief rest and again these injections of rest aren't meant to turn these workouts into intervals but to simply allow an athlete to go at a pace that's faster than they would attempt to go or like i think you described it to our athletes at our gym is the you know imagine your future self what pace would your future self want to go at we're going to practice that in this workout because you have a little bit of rest kind of sprinkled throughout the entire thing which should encourage you to go a little bit faster than you otherwise would but it's not quite an interval yeah, very, very similar structure. The The rest periods might look a little odd or it might be placed in a weird spot. But like like Sherb said, the idea there is um, rather than a fixed kind of like, hey, do everybody's going to feel a little bit different at certain parts. Instead, we take a little bit more care to say like the quarterfinal, the affiliate quarterfinal level athlete is likely to have to slow down after two rounds they're not they're going to go hot for two they're going to be able to go out pretty quick for two rounds and then that pace is going to drop off like okay how much rest do we need to give them to make sure that they can actually resume working at the pace that we wanted them to so um that's a that's a a, a style of workout that we program for individuals pre prepping for any competition or a semifinal. Um, I think it's a, it's just kind of cool something to mix in for those affiliate athletes. But um, yeah, that, that competitor extra every, every uh, just as kind of a reminder, but maybe you're a, maybe you're listening and you're a follower of misfit athletics um, and you kind of like the, you know, maybe you follow the hatchet program. Um, 
the competitor extra that we program is does fit within the rest. So we we prioritize kind of the the one hour affiliate class. So basically everything that you see in the strength slash skill column of the programming and conditioning. Those are the things we expect to be in a in a 60 minute class. And then the competitor extra is you know, exactly that for athletes who want a little bit more at our gym, we have a 90 minute class where we coach that third or second piece. Um, but just a, just another way to keep athletes, um, all on the same program, regardless of their goals, but it's, you know, it, it fits within the greater context of the program as a whole. Yeah. It's much better than piecemealing it from five different programs. Anything else to add gentlemen? That's that pretty much wraps up the, uh, phase four, Phase four for my affiliates. only other thing would, you know, if you don't use the open as a chance to rally your gym or a chance to like get the community involved or like, you know, people tend to come together around the holidays. And then there's like this weird, like everyone goes off into their own corner and dissipates. And then right before the open, there's like a call to action, like one week before get signed up. It's like, no, no, no. Like the new year is kind of a nice time to talk about setting as you know, new intentions for yourself. So leading up to the new year and kind of up until when the open starts, you should be talking about the open and why that matters. And like, try to create context for all athletes, similar to the way we just talked about that rowing piece where you have your high level athlete who gives a shit about the open, knows all about it and wants to do better than last year. And then your people who are brand new and are trying to find a reason why to keep training. All of these athletes can use the open to your, their advantage to kind of track themselves and see how they're doing. But you as the gym owner or the affiliate coach can also use your advantage to try to make your community tighter because the bond between your community is what makes your community great and what makes sure that people keep coming back through your doors is their experience they have with you. And the open is a really awesome thing if you leverage it in the way that is appropriate and make it fun and make it a, a community thing that you guys all do together. Coach, final thoughts? Yeah, I mean, kind of echoing what Sherb said, you know, this, uh, this next phase comes right up on the the beginning of the open and you know like when i started crossfit that was like one of the coolest things was like oh i got a chance to compete you know and then every year go back and look at where i am at and see you know so those benchmarks so you can see get your newest members to your most seasoned members you know to continue to strive for the same thing and then like what we're what you were talking about in your call to action for the members and coaches you know great time to get back to that you know working on the basics so they can continue to make progress. And, you know, the open is just a really easy way or a big way that people can, you know, see that from year to year. Definitely. Yeah. yeah the, I think the, la the last thing I'll add is just going back to the original topic, which applies to both coaches and athletes. And it's, it, it is trying to, you know, achieve a level of virtuosity or brilliance in the basics that lays the foundation for future improvement. Um, you, you, we want to help athletes who drink the Kool-Aid, who are excited, who are like, hey, I want to I want to do muscle ups. I want to do squat snatches. Quarterfinals seems cool. I want to crush the open. And that's awesome. And we want to leverage that motivation. But as coaches, we have to remember that, like all of those things start with a, you know, a, a broad and and solid foundation and then as a coach making sure that you know we kind of reassess our own capabilities go back to teaching the fundamentals like when's the last time you did squat therapy in your warm-up that sort of thing we, we actually forced everybody to to refine their their foot you know their foot width and re-emphasize some of the points of performance all of those things lead to a more uh, a more effective class and just a, a better experience for athletes when they know that you have kind of their best interest in mind. We did it. Did it. All right, ladies and gentlemen, thanks for listening to another episode of the Coaches Podcast. Um, if you're interested in signing up for Team Misfit Affiliate Programming, any time's a good time to, to join, and sometimes the middle of the phase, um, despite the fact that we have those tests and retests from, a, uh, from time to time, the middle of the phase is a great time to get your gym familiar with the style of programming so that when the first week of a phase rolls around, they're a little bit more comfortable. Coaches kind of have a feel for how the program is laid out, and then you can really not the whole phase out of the park but um anytime's a good time to jump in you can head to teammisfit.com to sign up there uh, or you can sign up in the sugar wad marketplace if your gym uses that platform see you guys later